This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. If you would turn in your Bibles, Joshua chapter 10, Joshua chapter 10, verses 1 through 5, our foundational text for this series that we're in. Notice verse 1, now it came to pass that when Adonazedic, king of Jerusalem, heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and its king, so he had done to Ai and its king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all its men were mighty. Therefore Adonizedek, king of Jerusalem, sent to Hoam, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, and Japhia, king of Lachish, and Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up to me and help me that we may attack Gibeon, for it has made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. And therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon gathered together and went up, they and all their armies, and camped before Gibeon and made war against it. And we're speaking in this series about conquering challenging relationships. Conquering challenging relationships. It's not a matter of if you will ever experience a challenging relationship. If you are around people in general, at some point somebody is going to rub you the wrong way. Somebody is going to misunderstand your motives. Somebody is going to assign something to you that is not who you really are. And so we have relationships in the earth that are not necessarily for you. There are people that will hate on you just because you're happy. You don't have to even do anything to people. You can just be smiling, minding your own business. And some people are against you. You've never said anything to these people. You've never met them before. And some people just meet you and they don't like you. And so you know that it's not that we are battling against flesh and blood. We are dealing with spirits. And you see here, the children of Israel had were in Gibeon, and Gibeon had made a covenant with these folks, and now the, the king got upset and went and got four other kings, and so now five against these folks, five of them, banding themselves together to keep them out of their promised land. There's always an enemy that is set up to try to keep you out of the place of promise for your life. Please don't assume that because God has peace and happiness for you, that it's just going to just roll out and just come to you like ripe cherries falling off of a tree. That's not how things work in the kingdom of God. In fact, the Bible teaches in the book of Acts that you enter into the kingdom through much tribulation. Whenever you're trying to birth anything, if you try to birth a baby, it's coming in pain. If you try to birth a business, it's coming in sorrow and disappointment and betrayal sometime. If you birth a ministry, it's going to be birthed in setback and discouragement and all kinds of things. Before anything can become great, it must overcome opposition. And uh, uh, there is no opportunity without opposition. Every time that God births a vision on the inside of you, every time that God gives you something that is a promise, a seed of something to unlock your destiny and take your life to the next level, there will come something to challenge it. Right when it looks like you're ready to give birth to something, here comes Slewfoot uh, trying to uh, make you abort the blessing. I mean, things that were promised to you, deals that were supposed to have been consummated by now. Folks that were supposed to help you and promise to do this and that this was supposed to happen and that was supposed to happen. And promotions were supposed to come and contracts were supposed to be signed and deals were supposed to be made and it didn't happen. And you wonder why. It's because there are enemies. There are always enemies. 
against anything that is good. You got to fight for stuff that's worth having. You really do. That's, that's just the truth about it. I mean, if you're going to have a destiny, you're going to have to fight for it. If you're going to have a vision, you're going to have to fight for it. If you've got a dream, you're going to have to fight for it. If it's a business, you've got to fight for it. If it's a ministry, you're going to have to fight for it. If it's a marriage, you're going to have to fight for it. You have to fight the good fight of faith. It's a fight. It's a fight, folks. And listen, if you're not willing to fight, you may as well just, just lay down now. Because it is a fight. It is a fight. We are in the fight of our lives, but thanks be unto God who gives us the victory. I mean, when he's already let us peep the end of the story, we don't exactly know how we get to that, but he's let us peep the end of the story. You know that the story is going to end with some warm and fuzzies. You know that, you know, it's going to be, you know, they're going to be reunited at the end and it feels so good. You, you know, you know, it's, you know, it's going to work out. You already know from the promise of his word, Romans 8, 28. And we know, not we guess, it's not hope, it's not maybe so. And we know, and we know that all things, not just some things, but everything, even the folks who told you no, even the people that rejected you, the folks that wouldn't help you. I mean, your muscles wouldn't have gotten strengthened had they helped you. If they uh, didn't reject you, then you would have thought, that your success was based exclusively on them. God let them reject you to let you know that I am your source. I'm with you. And the destiny that I have marked out for your life. I mean, he'll have to tell you, listen, you go and you do this and don't be afraid of their faces. God says, don't look at them. You look at me. So when you're doing your assignment, you've got to learn how to look in the right direction because there are some enemies stacked against you. And you know, they can come against you in seven, seven of them. They can ban and, and you know, and, and, and come united. Seven demons can come united totally, a de total satanic ploy. Seven is the number of completion. So that can be a total satanic plan or ploy set to keep you out of your destiny. Seven of them can come against you, unite it, band it together. But when the power of God is destined to make you who you are, he will strengthen you through the resistance. Resistance produces strength. You, we call it strength tra uh, training. When you're in the gym and you're pushing weights, it's resistance, but it's building muscle. It's resistance, but it's building muscle. And when the glory of God, when they discover that you cannot stop this, this plane that's coming down this runway because it's getting ready to be airborne. There's nothing, you know, once it's got a certain amount of speed on it, you, you just got to back up out of the way. And the things that came against you united, they will start scattering in seven different directions. They were united when they came against you, but then they will be scattered, running for their life. And if you just, I'm just, if you'll hang in there, God will give you a testimony. Don't quit on him too soon because you got discouraged or because you got tired. Don't quit because you get tired. You quit because you get finished. Because there are going to be some folks that's going to make you want to cuss them out. Or you will meet some of them. Some of you all have already met them several times. <laughs> and you've had to, you know, it takes everything on the inside of you. But just realize that there is something that your body will never produce until you get provoked. God's got a plan. He's got a plan. But I just want you to remember these different spirits. These are relationships that we still have to deal with today. Remember, uh, God told the children of Israel... There were in the New Testament, see this is Old Testament, but in the New Testament, there were five things, sins that kept them out of the, uh, of the promised land. All of those folks that died in the wilderness, five things kept them out. Lust, idolatry, fornication, tempting Christ, and murmuring. Did you know just having a negative mouth can curse you from being able to come into what God has planned for you. You don't want people on your team talking about, well, I don't think we're going to make it. This is too hard. We are we tired and we hungry. We didn't ask you, were you tired or you hungry? Are you finished? Are you finished? There are some times you got to be tired and hungry and still keep on trucking. You got you to get finished. You got to get finished because you, if you don't finish, you don't eat. And I'm just telling you, you got to have a motivator built in so strongly that I can't stop where I am. I'm pressing my way because I'm on my way to something and I'm too close now. I've been through too much to quit. 
How many of you all feel like you've already been to enough stuff? And as much stuff as you, I mean, you've already fought through a whole lot of stuff. The devil has already tried to discourage you and make you abort your dream and your vision. He's let people turn their back on you, misuse you, hurt you, abuse you, abandon you, and all of that. You've come too far now to be discouraged by little stuff, petty stuff. Be aggravated by trifling folks who don't have enough going on in their own life and they want to create drama in yours. And so notice here, uh, remember Adonai Zedek means Lord of Justice. It means Lord of Justice. In other words, Adonai Zedek, this is the spirit of self-justification. He tries to justify whenever you do wrong. It tries to justify being mediocre. If you keep justifying something, you'll never change it. Well, you know, I was sleepy. It's the sun was in my eye. Uh, I didn't have enough time. You know, I'm late because of the traffic. No, no, no. When you're supposed to be somewhere on time, to get there on time is to be late. You get there ahead of time. My uncle, I had an uncle, and, and, and he, he said to me, he says, there's one reason that anybody's ever late. He says, you didn't start out in time. He says, don't tell me about the traffic. I had traffic. I mean, when one person is there and they came through traffic, so the only reason that you're late, because you didn't start out in time. And you know, if you really back that up, you know, it's, it's, it's the truth. If you justify it, you'll never correct it. Whatever you justify. And see, when you justify yourself, it means that now God cannot justify you. We strip, it, it, we become God because God is the only God of justice. Justice can only ultimately come from God. And if we justify ourselves, now God says, okay, you already justified, so I can't justify you. And real justification only means something in his book, not ours. It means something in his book. And then the second king is Hoham. That means Jehovah protects the multitude. Jehovah protects the multitude. You know, the Bible talks in so many instances about God being our shield, our buckler. He's our rear guard. He's with us. He's, he's the, the, the one who's in front of us. God is the protector of the multitude. And see, Hoham is, uh, is the king of Hebron. It means the seat of association. So if you put it all together, that message means Jehovah protects the multitude of association. In other words, it, it's a saying that when we start trying to play God ourselves by protecting our own interests, you would never sleep if you would stay up all night wondering who is trying to undermine you. Remember, the Lord is the one who neither slumbers nor sleeps. There's no need in both parties being up all night. I mean, if we're going to be up trying to watch over everything, that, that's too much going on. It's too much going on in the world for you to stay up and try to figure everything out that's going on with you, going on with your mama, going on with your daddy, your husband, your wife, your son, your daughter, your cousin, your brother, your sister, your co-worker, your neighbor. You can't watch everything. Let God be God. Just let God be God. Uh, and so Hoham is, is an attempt to try to be God because we're trying to protect everything. We're trying to play God. But when you trust God, you don't have to play God. When you trust God, you don't have to play God. Just trust him to be God. Trust him to be God. Touch your neighbor, says, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Just stay in your lane. Just stay in your lane. Doesn't it make you uh, a bit agitated when you know what you're doing and somebody starts trying to direct you and tell you what you need to be doing better don't you want to I mean sometimes they might have rank and you want to say to them so badly just stay in your lane you have to learn how to say it up under your breath stay in your lane stay in your lane stay. don't come over here don't come over here <laughs> You will be surprised how much better you feel when you learn to talk to yourself. It's, you're not crazy when you talk to yourself. You go crazy when you fail to talk to yourself. And the crazy folks that you see talking to themselves, they waited too long. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's talking to yourself that'll keep you from going crazy. You, I mean, you have to say, uh, Jesus, don't let me hit her. <laughs> See, you have, you, have that, you have to have the conversation ahead of time. Because if you keep on, if you don't have the conversation, you are liable to snap. And when you snap and then start talking, oh, 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 it's on then. Come on, it's reality TV time, live, bring it all now. And so you have to trust God, let God be God. And so we have to just say, God, you're God, I'm not. You forgive, you're gracious, you're merciful, and I'm just going to let you be God. But this second relationship of King Hoam is the, is the tempting relationship that tries to make you become God over your own life. It's the same trick that the devil did with Adam and Eve in the garden. He says, you know, God was their discernment. And so now the serpent comes and says to Eve, you know, this is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It is, which is discernment. God was that discernment. He says, wouldn't you like to know? He says, because then you will be like God. They were already like him, made in his image after his likeness. They were already like him. Isn't that the trick of the devil to make you think that you are not something already? You're already that. And the bag of chips. You're already that. He deceived them into thinking that they were something. It's not what you are that stops you. It's what you think you are not. It's not what you are that hinders you. It's what you think that you are not that hinders you. It's the thinking. And so the devil asked her a question that made her question her identity. God knows that you'll be like him. Don't you want to know what he knows? If they, if they needed God, they had unbroken relationship and fellowship with him. God would tell them, don't, don't trust her. He was their discernment. When you have God in your life, I'm just telling you, anybody know that you, you've ever been and you know the Holy Spirit? Now, you might not have known at the time. You might have said, something told me. And in retrospect, you realize that that something was the Lord who is your discernment. So, but when we try to play God, I don't care how good you are, you will always misjudge some people. And it's a terrible thing when you misjudge them and marry them. Oh. That's, oh, you, you need a serious prayer. All kinds of deliverance and, and help. But this third challenging relationship is with Pyram. Pyram. Pyram means a, a, wild, uh, a wild donkey. It means, you see what it is. It, it is what it is. Uh, I'm from the old school. I don't use profanity. But he's a... Pyram means a wild donkey. It means swift, something that's just really fast. And he is the king of Jarmuth, which means elevation. He's a king of Jarmuth, which means elevation. Jarmuth, when you put that together, is somebody who is quick-tempered, high-minded and quick-tempered. This is that, that spirit. This is that relationship. It has a a reference to being high-minded and prideful. And I want you to realize that all of life's successes come from initiating relationships with the right people and then strengthening those relationships. Just think about that for a moment. That all of life's successes come from initiating relationships with the right people and then strengthening those relationships. And your failures come from initiating relationships with the wrong people and strengthening those relationships. I know everybody right now can think of somebody that you wish you never met. I mean, people that swindle money out of you, your time, your energy, your affection, your creativity, you making special dinners and going over their house, washing their clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's so somebody that that you wish 
that you had never, ever met because it didn't pan out. It just didn't pan out. And, you know, and we thought we knew. We thought that we knew. See, this is where this, this, this is that Pyram spirit. He's, he's, he's swift. He's, he's a wild donkey. He wilding out. Just wild, just free spirit. And we, we, we're seeing these spirits released in our society today. You, you know, just turn on the reality TV shows. You know, you, you, you see them manifested. You see them manifest just wild and high minded. You know, think more of themselves than what they ought. Filled with all kinds of stuff. But people can usually trace their successes and their failures to relationships in their lives. You can trace your successes and your failures to relationships in your life. There are some people that you meet and they bless your life. And there are some people that you meet and you wish you didn't meet them. Because they took you down a path and introduced you to stuff that got you away from who you were really called to be. May I just remind you of this? Pain begins when wrong voices are given the gift of access into your life. Let me just remind you of that. That pain begins when wrong voices are given the gift of access into your life. Wrong voices are given the gift of access into your life. That's when pain starts coming. Wrong relationships. When the devil really wants to mess up a young woman or a young man, he sends in a contaminated, toxic relationship. Somebody that looks good on the outside, sound all smooth and everything. And then y'all on the phone for hours and hours. If you hang up first. <laughs> and then you get to a point in the relationship, you see them calling you and you won't even answer. You put in your contact, do not answer. <laughs> you block them. You do this, you know. <laughs> but may I just say this? I don't know whether some of you all have noticed this or not. But oftentimes wrong people won't leave your life voluntarily. They only leave when you go broke. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. But this, this spirit here, I want you to see that Pyram, who is from Jarmuth, it's that name again means elevation. He's Pyram, king of Jarmuth, elevation. He's king of elevation, high-mindedness. And you know what high-mindedness, where it leads you. I want you to notice Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 21 in the uh, English Standard Version. It says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher... Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And then he said, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Let me tell you, this is Jesus talking now. Jesus says, a person's life does not. Do you, do you all see that? It does not consist in the abundance of, of, of his possessions. If that were the case, all rich people would be happy. Totally fulfilled. And yet we know rich people that commit suicide. Life does not consist in the abundance of things. There are some people who are in relationship today that used to really be in love when they didn't have anything, they were, in a, they were sharing a one-bedroom apartment. And they could have had a leaky roof and a door that didn't close well. But they were in love with each other. And they couldn't buy the kind of food and go out to eat where they wanted to eat. But they made it with rice and beans and cornbread. And they were all so in love. Then they moved to a nice big home. And then they get clothes and cars and jewelry and stuff. And more shoes than you can count. And they're not even happy. And you see, it's because one's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he possesses or she possesses. 
is not in things. Life does not consist in things. And then we spend all of our life trying to get things and end up losing our things trying to regain our life. Trying to find out who, who we are. Because our identity, we start loving things and using people instead of loving people and using things. And so, and then I want you to notice when Jesus was dealing with this and he's saying, listen, life, a person's life, it does not consist in the abundance of things. In verse 16, he says, he told them a parable saying the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. This is the spirit of Pyram coming in. This is Pyram. He's, he's high-minded. And I want you to notice how much he's into himself. His ego is out of control. You know that ego stands for edging God out. I want you to notice how he doesn't attribute any of this stuff to God. He's blessed. He's, you know, one plants a seed, another waters. But what happened? God gives the, who gives the increase? God gives the increase. So now here's a man who gets increase and starts now taking credit for it. That's a problem. That's a serious problem. So Jesus gives this parable, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And God is the one that causes your land to produce plentifully. Because see, there are other people that work just as hard as you and sometimes harder and they didn't get the results you got. And then he thought to himself. Notice he's into himself. He thought to himself. Say himself. And then notice, I just want you to underscore, just take note of how many times he uses the word I. Notice in verse 17. What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. He is, this dude is totally in himself. Notice verse 18. He's still not finished. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. You don't have to wonder whose it is, do you? <laughs> and then he says, I will say to my soul. Listen, all souls belong to God. And now he's taking possession. I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night. I, I, you know, I like how God just called it straight. And this is Jesus telling the story. This night, your soul is required of you. And the things you have, pre have prepared, whose will they be? And so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You know, I was with a rich person one day and I, I was prompted of the Holy Ghost to ask this question. I said, have you thought about the fact that everything that you have amassed that you may save it up and leave it to a fool. Everything that you've worked so hard for. And you may store it up and leave it for a fool. You will be surprised. You amass stuff and folks don't have the wisdom and the integrity of heart to even know what to do with the blessing. Look at Paris Hilton. I don't know that her granddaddy would be proud of somebody who has inheritance of what he did by working hard and her claim to fame is being a socialite. It's amazing that life does not consist in the, abund the abundance of things that a person possesses. Because oftentimes the temptation for Pyram is to say, look what my soul has provided. And the truth of the matter is, is when we stop to give thanks, it's all things come of thee, O Lord. It is by thy hands we all are fed. 
even though we work hard because there are people that work hard and plant seed and they reap no harvest. And if God has breathed on your field for you to be able to have food on your table, I'm just telling you, we, we have to have a, a heart of thanksgiving to say, God, you know what? I didn't deserve all of this because we haven't always done the right things because God could have given you some other stuff. He knew some other tricky stuff you did. Some sneaky stuff, some low down stuff, some dirty stuff. So we don't deserve what God will have given us. God blesses us in an incredible, incredible way. So can you see how this, this rich fool was so full of himself that he had no room to glorify God for all that God had done for him? And he blessed him. And he's saying, look at all of my stuff here. I will build bigger barns for all of my goods, for all of, that my hands have done. He's just all into himself. What about the truth of Proverbs, of, of, I mean Psalms 24 verse 1 uh, that says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. He's up there, my soul. No, no, no. Not only does the earth belongs to, belong to the Lord, but the fullness that's in the earth, which means everything that's on planet earth belongs to God. God created the world. He's the Lord of the world. Everything, every tree, every gem, every bit of petroleum, it all belongs to God. The diamonds, uh, the, the jasmine, the, the, the jade, it all belongs to God. The onyx, the platinum, the gold, the silver, it all belongs to God. It all belongs to God. The earth is the Lord and the fullness. That means everything that fills the earth belongs to God. Everything. And he said, not only does the earth belong to me and everything that's in the earth, but he says, all of those who dwell therein. Everybody who's there, he said, these are my people. I created them. I created them. I mean, this is the progenitor of the generations of every person who's on the planet. Not, not merely the one who gave birth to us. He's the one that created us in his likeness and after his image and put his seed in us. And then said, reproduce after your kind. And this is God's way of saying, you know what? All of these are my grandbabies. These are, you create one and then you put a seed in them and give them the power and command them to be fruitful and to multiply and to replenish and subdue. And you release that into the earth for them to do this, this great work that they do. And it's amazing how God can do that and bless us in such a marvelous, marvelous way. And so we belong to God. We are his creation. We're the work of his hands. And so everything that he's created, we belong to God. He created us. We have offspring. Those offspring belong to God. We are his servant. So not only the earth, but everything that fills the earth and those who dwell therein. So all of this stuff, it belongs to God. So how dare we get full of ourselves? It all belongs to God. We only become the, the stewards of what God entrusts into our stewardship. And everything is temporary in the earth until you pass into the eternal. Everything is temporary. I'm the bishop of the house for now, but you know what? I, I tell people, you know, you go to a church and there's, you know, they, they're in between pastors and then they have this title called an interim pastor. I said, we all are interim pastors. We all, I had to tell other pastors, we all are interim pastors. You're not going to be here forever. We all are interim pastors. Everybody who's pastoring is interim. There'll be a, only so long that they can do it and then you'll have to t pass it off to somebody else because they are an interim pastor because it's not ours. We're just a steward. I don't care what you have. Your children are not yours. One day you're going to have to give them back to God because they're going to walk off and leave you anyway. <laughs> Call you whenever. <laughs> you know. You have to give it back to God. It belongs to God anyway. Everything that God blesses you with, he will require it back. He'll bring you to certain low points in your life and he says, give me the business back. Give me your dream back. Give it to me. Let it fall as a seed to the ground or else it's going to abide alone. But if you, if you let it, just give it, give it back to me. I gave it to you. I trust you. Give it back to me. 
Everything that he gave you, he's going to ask for it back. It's, it's all temporary until we enter into that world that is eternal. But here this man is talking about my soul and my hands and my barns and, and all of my stuff, my land. Where was his humility? Where was his humility? Have you ever noticed what Proverbs uh, uh, Psalm 51 and verse 17 says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. God loves humility, brokenness. He loves it. He loves it. Notice how God works. Matthew chapter 23, verse 12 in the New Living Translation. But those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This man was exalting himself. He was about to be humble because he said, fool. <laughs> it was, it's just a matter of time. You know pride precedes a fall. It, it, it's, it, it, Jesus is teaching us the principle. Those who exalt themselves will be humbled. They're going to be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Notice Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Notice, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. See, we have to conquer this temptation of this nature that's in our own minds that makes us want to rebel and do our own thing. This is the, this is the, the pyram spirit that's just a wild donkey that will not be tamed. It's full of pride. You see, pride is the strength of sin. Pride, it is the strength of sin. But if you don't conquer this relationship with Pyram, you will reach a place that you won't be able to stay. See, high-mindedness, you might be high-minded, you can get there, but you won't be able to stay. It's, it precedes a fall. So you may go up into a high place, but you're coming down. You know, you do something dirty to get something the wrong way. You can get be there for a minute, but you get arrogant over that, you're going to fall. You're coming down. You're, it's coming down. Remember, Pyram is wild, and wild is the root of wilderness. Wild is the root of wilderness. Now, were the people of God de destined for the wilderness, or were they destined for the promised land? Wild is the root of wilderness. They were in the wilderness, but on their way to the promised land. And so don't ever, don't ever make a temporary uh, place a permanent abode. And there are too many people that never go on into their promised land because they build their permanent dwelling place in a wild place, in a wilderness, where things grow just wild. Wild things belong in the wilderness, and they are kept there. And so as long as you're in the wilderness, you can't reach your promised land. I want to give you some, some of Webster's definitions of wild, and then I want to give you some spiritual parallels to that. Number one, wild, according to Webster, is living in a state of nature and not ordinarily tamed or domesticated. That's, that's wild. That's one, one way. I, and here's the spiritual parallel. It means that you are ruled by your carnal nature. You're ruled by your carnal nature. So we, uh, we just get it from the natural and, and then the, the natural and then the spirit. Here's number two. Webster says growing or produce without the aid or care of man. So that's like wild flowers, wild honey. It's produced without man. It's wild. We call it wild because it's produced without man's intervention. And the spiritual parallel is a person who is unsubmitted or uncovered. They have no accountability to man. No accountability is a dangerous place to be. Because if you're wrong, nobody has the authority to correct you. If you're speeding down a road and somebody could just say, oh, hold on, hold on here. And they'd be like, oh, excuse me, who are you talking to? You ain't my daddy. And then they go right on and, 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 and fall off of something very dangerous because they wouldn't allow anybody to correct them. Just wild. wild. They want to do it without any involvement. That's wild. Number three is not inhabited or cultivated. It's not inhabited. That, that's a, a wild place. Here's the spiritual uh, parallel is that it is devoid of the spirit and the word of God. 
wild. It's just wild. It is devoid of the Spirit and the world of, Word of God. Because God's Word begins to bring order. In the beginning, uh, when the earth was without form and void, in another translation calls it chaos. But when the Word was released, order came to the chaos. God's Word and His Spirit will bring order. See, it was, the Spirit was already there hovering over the face of the deep, waiting on the Word. And when the Word was released, the Word brought order to the chaos. When you bring God's Word into a situation, it brings order into the chaos. When people are living according to the dictates of their own flesh, doing what they want to do, but when the Word of God comes in, the Word brings order. When a husband and a wife will, will let the Word be the ruling entity, and it's not like I feel it, it's got all baby to be, and it seemed like to me. No, no, no. What does the Word of the Lord say? When you move in the power of the Word of God, it brings order to chaos, order to chaos so that, that we are not wild. Here's number four, when you, it means uncontrolled, uncontrolled. And, and here's the spiritual parallel, it simply means undisciplined, undisciplined. Number five is uh, we call a person wild if they are emotionally overcome. This is Webster's definition, emotionally overcome. You know how when the Holy Ghost hit some people? And they become emotionally overcome. And, uh, and what happens to them looks wild. I've been in some places, seen the Spirit hit some people, and boy, it is, you know, it is not choreographed. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. It's wild. Arms go to flailing this way and all kind of stuff, you know. It's, it's, it's wild. It's, it's wild. But the spiritual parallel is a person who is ruled by his or her emotions. A person who's ruled by his or her emotion. Here's number six, going beyond normal or conventional bounds. That's when you're wilding out. Going beyond normal or conventional bounds. When they don't know boundaries. That's, that's called being wild. Just being wild. The spiritual parallel it means that the person is demonically inspired. It means that there's a lack of balance. There's a lack of temperance in that person's life. And they push everything to an excess. They push everything to excess. They can't just do a little. They got to, they got to get smashed. Because they're, they're wilding out. They won't just be with one partner. They, they want to train. Just wilding out. They know no limits. They know no boundaries. They know no limit. They're just wilding out, totally unrestrained. It's, it's demonic. They, they get into stuff that is painful and learn to enjoy it. It's sadistic. That's satanically, demonically inspired. And here's number seven, while Webster says it's loose from restraint or regulation. Loose from restraint or regulation. Now, you know what a, when an animal gets loose, wow, when they're wow. You know, I was over in, in, in uh, South Africa, and I'm in the, one of the largest natural parks, and I have to really, you know, it, it had to dawn on me, you're not in a, you're not in a, this is not a zoo. <laughs> I mean, the animal park is 800 square miles. It, it's like a whole, st about like the state of Texas or whatever. It's, it's a huge place. And, and I have to say to myself, this is, this is not a zoo. This is not a zoo. And, and there have been people that have been killed there because they have houses that when you can actually stay in that in, environment. And they have to tell at, at nightfall, get in your house, don't open it up. And you know the curious people. <laughs> oh, I can't believe it. And they come out with a camera and they want to, <laughs> oh my God, I can't believe I'm this close. These things are wild. They are not tamed. They've not been domesticated. You are in their natural habitat. You're in their natural They're not in it. They don't have a zookeeper. They can roam for 200 miles and not see a person. They don't know you. <laughs> and people are standing there. They got snacks all in the cards. These things will smash your window in. Listen. And I took my wife, she was with me in South Africa one time, and I said, Listen, you know, I, I want to go to the lion place. They, 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 I, I was so intimidated. It, it went like a little Volkswagen Beetle. 
And uh, these are huge animals, hundreds of pounds. And, uh, and there come 12 or 15 of these giant lions around. And they've closed the gate behind us. I mean, when they let us into the park area, they open one gate, the car drove in, they close that gate, then they open the other gate, and then we drive on. And we get there, and it is, you know, thank God we had just gotten there the day after they were fed. I wanted to be there on the day that they were feeding them. <laughs> they feed them once a week. I wanted to see the frenzy of all of them going after that meat with their ravenous appetites, and I missed it by one day. So I go on the day and they're all sleepy. <laughs> I bet I wasn't going to get out of the car <laughs> trying to take a selfie with a lion. <laughs> I mean, I'm a Leo, you know, and everything, but uh... <laughs> but loose from restraint, they were loose from restraint and regulation. Here's the spiritual parallel of a wild person. As people who have no vision. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. My people, for you know, they perish for lack of a vision. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Another version says they cast off restraints. They go wild because there's no vision, no open vision, no revelation that disciplines their life to work toward an intended goal. And see, one reason that Pyram exists is because people are untamed and undisciplined in their spirits. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, gives us a real key in the, in the English Standard Version. It, it, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, says this, But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. This is the Apostle Paul. This is not just a common Joe Blow, you know. This is the apostle who is attributed to writing 13 books of the New Testament, who went to prison. And, and he's this man of God who had a Damascus Road experience with Jesus Christ himself because he never met Jesus in the flesh. He only knew him by revelation. Gifted of the Holy Ghost. And Paul, who's anointed, who says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than y'all. Paul said, I have to beat my body down. Uh, the original Greek says that I pummeled my body to make it a slave. I pummeled my body to make it a slave. He says, I, I buffet my body. To buffet means to give one blow after another. I pummel it. I just pow, 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 down boy, pow, down boy, pow. You have to do it over and over and over because you tell your flesh to sit down and your flesh is looking at something good. Down boy, down boy, da down boy, down. You, you can't talk to a dog one time. Down boy, da da down. You, you do that and the dog will still be pulling against the, the reins. You have to tell him two or three times. You have to do it. You have to buffet it one blow after another. One blow after another, one blow after another. Paul said, I discipline my body. It's not just automatically disciplined because you saved. He said, I discipline my body and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. And that just tells you that all flesh is unsaved and unsanctified. And you have to discipline your flesh. You have to talk to yourself. You have to pummel your, your flesh. You have to beat it down. We must make an intentional decision that we are going to keep step with the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17 says this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the, the, the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things that you want to do. You see, the reason that we fail to walk in the spirit as we should is because we've confused it with doing church stuff. You see, you're walking in the spirit when you discipline your children in love. 
Uh, when you get to work on time, you're walking in the spirit. Whenever you're honest, you're walking in the spirit. When you obey what God has told you to do, you're walking in the spirit. But I want you to realize this, that King Pyram is the carnal mind. It's the carnal mind. And if you live in your carnal mind, you can't enter into that promise land. He's the carnal mind. Pyram rules because generally some basic need of our human personality has not yet been met. People who are wild are missing something. People who are wild are missing something. You go to every wild young girl, she's missing something. Every wild young man, he's missing something. Every wild person is missing something. And they are wild because they are looking for what they missed. Every wild person is missing something. Whenever you see a wild little boy, a wild girl, they're missing love. They're missing affection. They're missing discipline, correction in their life. They are missing something. Every wild person is missing something and they're wilding out on a search trying to find what they're missing. They are, they are trying to find what they're missing. You see, sin is often the result of a perceived unmet need. They are basic needs of our human personality. I've told them to you before. Is number one, to be loved unconditionally because that gives us security. To be understood. That means to be listened to. So that means that we have a need to communicate. For, for somebody to listen to us and to hear our hearts and, and hear our pain and, and hear our frustrations and to hear our hopes and our dreams and our aspiration. You need somebody just, just to fantasize with, just to tell them, oh girl, this is who I want to marry. Yeah, girl, this is the one. Yeah, man, I want her. Yeah, man, man, if I can get with her. You need somebody that will listen to you. We have a, a need to be loved we have a need to be understood. Thirdly, we have a need to be valued. To be valued. Because we have a need to be needed. We have a need to be needed. Nobody wants to just uh, be felt as though you are an option. We have a need in our lives to be needed, to be valued. Valued. And fourthly, we have a need to be remembered. We have a need to be remembered. In other words... Our need to be remembered comes out of our need to make a meaningful contribution to God's world. To make a meaningful contribution to God's world. I told you when we were at uh, St. Jude's Hospital, there's a little girl there that was dying of cancer with seven years old. And one of the nurses asked the little girl, baby, are, 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 you, are you afraid of dying, sweetheart? And she said, no, I'm not afraid of dying. She said, I am afraid of not being remembered. Because there's a human need in every human personality to feel remembered. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. Because we all have a need to be remembered. We have a need to be remembered. You need to do something for some people in this earth so you're remembered. And, and I mean in a good way. You don't want to be remembered for always causing trouble. You want people to remember you because you took time with them. Because you encouraged them. Because you believed in them. Because you saw something in them. Because you fed them. I mean, that you want to do something that gives you value as making a meaningful contribution to God's world. And we can only function effectively to the degree that needs, those needs are met in our life. And may I just say this to you, that the real need for security and self-worth and significance can only be fully met through a close and ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ. It can only be met through Him. Because if you look for people to meet a need that only God can meet, you will always be frustrated with people. Always. Always, don't look to a man or a woman to do for you what only God can do. We can never satisfy through things or people what can only be fulfilled through God himself. We never can.
Well, I hope you got something out of the Word of the Lord. We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.